I hope we can be the beneficiaries of this conversation tonight, and I'd like to have Lisa Brown and Joe Zarelli and Ross Reynolds come onto the stage. Thank you. You are so public-minded to be here on this gorgeous summer night. I, if, if John has not already praised that, I, I want to take, make absolute mention of it. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I've been li really looking forward to this conversation to hear what these two major figures in the state Senate, major figures in the state legislature have to say about some of the issues of the day. Um, Joe Zarelli uh, vi uh, resigned his Senate seat effective May 31st after 17 years representing Ridgefield in Southeast Washington. And uh, we've talked a lot about the budget. He's been the budget leader for the Republicans, and he's a business consultant now in Ridgefield. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Lisa Brown has announced she's not going to be seeking re-election for most of her Spokane district. She served a couple of terms in the State House uh, before joining the Senate in 96 and then in 2005. She became the first Democratic woman in state history to hold the position of Senate Majority Leader, making her among the longest serving leaders in recent Washington history. And she's also a tenured professor at, professor at Gonzaga University. Um, I want to, first of all, start about this decision to leave. You both were in pretty safe districts, and you probably could have gotten reelected without too much difficulty. And uh, maybe we can start with you, Joe. Why don't you pull that microphone a little bit, a little bit closer so it'll be tight in there. You um, resigned even before the end of your term in, in May. Um, you've talked about this a little bit before. You've talked about the decision, once you decided to leave, the decide to leave right away was not that hard to make. No. It, see, no, I'm left-handed, see, so this mic has no business being over here. <laughs> I, you know, this Italian blood in me is gonna knock this thing all over the stage tonight, but I'll try my best. Yeah, you know, I, uh, uh, once I made the decision, the hard one was whether I run again. And once I made that decision not to run again, the second part was very easy in my mind. Um, I've become the kind of legislator that, you know, I like to try to put 100% in to what I'm to do. Uh, and in the role that I've played, there are several different committees related to budget, finance, forecasting that I have a responsibility to be on. And I wanted a clean break. And I knew that if I decided not to run, then I needed to just leave the legislator, legislature, and that's what I decided to do so that I could then focus on what was next for me. Cause Believe it or not, uh, I didn't do this because I had something else to run to um, or to run for. I did it because I thought it was my time to move on to something different. And uh, so I needed that time and space without any kind of ethical obligation or connection um, to do other things so I can be free to do what I need to do next. Um, both of you were interviewed by Austin Jenkins. And I don't know if any of you have seen that interview that Austin Jenkins did with the two of them. If you, did, if you haven't, I'd really recommend that you check it out. It's, it's really excellent. One of the things you talked about in that was the fact that um, part of your leaving kind of right in May was the fact that you, I, I got the sense you were saying you saw other people who were kind of addicted to politics, maybe addicted to politics in a bad way and had to stay with it. I want, what, what did you mean by that? Well, I've been in 17 years and a lot of people, depending on who you talk to, would say, well, we need you around, but a lot of people probably say it's time to go, Joe. But uh, either way, what I've seen in Olympia is um, the whole, whole thing about being in polit politics, good or bad, and there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad, um, there's a form of addiction, I think, that can uh, keep you doing something that maybe you shouldn't do anymore or you really don't want to do or keep you from moving on to the next thing, very similar to other addictions, and that is in politics, there's a bit of a limelight, um, again, good or bad. Um, there's a, an aura of a little bit of, of power, a little bit more than the average person walking the street. All these different things um, kind of work on the mind. And you can, if you don't keep it under control, begin to think that you're somebody different than the people you represent. Um, and I've seen people, I believe, hang around way too long, and they've come to a point where they really have uh, very little opportunity after politics to enjoy the other piece of their life that they missed out on while doing this job. Because believe it or not, if you do this job right, regardless of your uh, political, um, um, which side of the political uh, side you're on, um, there's a lot of work and a lot of commitment that you have to put into it. So it is very time consuming. Mm -hmm. Lisa Brown, can you relate to that, the problem of addiction to, the, to people always wanting your time, feeling important? The, bit of public renown someone has as an elected official? Well, that's certainly the case. I guess for me, that was tempered from the very beginning because when I entered the legislature, as John has already pointed out, I had 
a young son. Uh, I went home every night. I didn't do the whining and dining. And so um, I, I can definitely relate to the fact that you are treated differently in the legislature. But for me, I love public policy. I'm still very passionate about my politics. I just thought that there was another way to engage in public policy and politics, and that after 20 years in the legislature, it began to be clear to me that I'd accomplished a lot of the things I'd set out to do for Spokane and in the public policy arena in the legislative environment, and that it was time for me to try something different. One thing I love about the legislature and that I will miss, in addition to the people, the great great staff and the interactions you have with thousands of people from all walks of life throughout the year. But one of the things I will miss is that it's very intellectually challenging. There's always something to learn. Politics is a little bit of a strategy game. The legislature certainly is. And I will miss that intellectual stimulation, but I know there are other ways for me to find it. A, it there's a bit of a game to it, and I think that's absolutely true. Um, in a game, certainly in chess and in many games, you don't want the opponent to know what you're doing. You want to be able to surprise people. Is, do you think that's part of the political game, if you agree it's a game, Joe Cirelli? Yeah, I, I try not to look at it as a, as a game as much as a, a strategy to find success. And success is defined by the individual, by the party, uh, by a majority, um, in a bipartisan uh, majority or a partisan majority. So. Um, yeah, and, and to affect that plan like anything else, nobody goes into the football stadium on Sunday giving the defense their offensive playbook. Um, but you get to see it as it progresses, and if you're, and if you're watching, as Lisa's I indicated, and you take up that intellectual challenge, you can see what's formulating and what's coming before you. But um, it's a little different than a game, but I think it's, it's a strategy that you have to employ to try to get to an end. Well, you certainly pulled off a surprise in this past legislative session that was a surprise to me, and I want to find out if it was a surprise to you. You managed to get three Democrats to come over to your side to pass a budget in the Senate, which was something I'd never heard of, of happening. How did you manage to do that? Well, I, I think it was kind of the perfect storm of, of things that were going on, and it, for me, it, it, it wasn't, there was no game plan set up. It evolved. Um, and, and I think Len, Lisa would probably indicate, uh, being candid, that they were on the same um, uh, approach, trying to get to 25 votes. And it was one of those scenarios where uh, somebody had to get 25 votes or we'd be sitting there in a stalemate um, at, at some point. And it worked out the way things were set up and um, uh, what people thought were important that we were able to put the 25 votes together. You eventually had to, of course, compromise with the Democratic governor of the Democratic House to get something through, so was it, um, did anything major get accomplished by your one victory there, getting them to vote for a Republican budget? Well, the goal wasn't to get a Republican budget. It was to um, get something out of the Senate from our perspective that was more to our liking, knowing that we would have to go the other direction. The year before when Senator Murray and, and uh, Senator uh, Brown and Senator Hewitt and all of us kind of worked together and we decided this was a plan for Washington, in the Senate at least, was to find common ground and get something done, was the same approach that we intended to take this, this last year. But some different things um, kind of came to the forefront that made it a little more difficult to get to that. Um, but that was, that was always the approach that we were trying to work on. And we knew ultimately that, you know, um, having been around 17 years and most people have been around their year know that you need three uh, sign-offs to get any kind of thing done, whether it be in policy or budget. And you've got to have the House, the Senate, and the yeah. Governor together on something. So we always knew we'd have to go that way. But when you start from a position that you're most comfortable with, you're in a better position to get out to a middle ground from our perspective. Um, that was more workable for you. And I didn't see that we were going to get any middle ground had it started from the other side. Yeah. And that's kind of the course we were on it. Well, Senator Brown, what was that like for you to have three members of your party? You're the Senate Majority Leader, and all of a sudden they've gone over to the Republican side and passed the budget. Did you see that coming? Uh, I did. I, I didn't know exactly when or what form it would take, but I've been in the Senate for a long time, and when the majority is close enough, I've seen senators cross the aisle many times. I had two senators, well, actually four Republican senators cross the aisle to vote for the budget when I was Ways and Means Chair, um, two the first time the budget went across the floor, 
and because their leadership wasn't very happy with them, another two for the final budget. So that was not an unusual experience for me being in the Senate. Uh, I will say, based on our previous year's experience where we had worked together, we had managed to come up with a budget in one of the most difficult economic situations that I have faced in 20 years that actually most of my members and a good percentage of Senator Zarelli's members could vote for, I was predisposed to try to continue that process into this year. And I think perhaps um, I was a bit naive to think that that was going to be as easy in an election year as it, as it had been the year before. And, and actually, not Senator Zarelli, but his, his leadership, Senator Hewitt, had actually said to me, and I guess it hadn't quite resonated, uh, that if for, he said very specifically um, publicly before the legislative session started and then in my office as time went on, that essentially in order to work on the budget together, he wanted us to back off from some of the social issues we were planning on moving forward, specifically marriage equality. And that was something I just couldn't do, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't do. And I think in that framework that the, the, the agreement to come together around the budget was ultimately pretty unrealistic from the beginning of session, but I thought we could potentially get there. Senator Murray thought we could potentially get there. We, we were aware and obviously very aware of, of the other issues that became tied to the budget and actually committed to working on them, but I didn't agree with them in the form they were originally introduced. And so we can, we can disagree about how it ultimately occurred. I think the outcome is not that far from the outcome we would have gotten without a ninth order maneuver. Um, but of course, that's in hindsight, and I, I can't really prove that to anyone. You, um, uh, people in the, in the state legislature come up with uh, theme songs, and your theme song was um, Circle Game by Joni Mitchell, which includes the line, we're captive on the carousel of time. And I was reading that lyric and thinking about your decision to leave. Did you feel as though you were a captive on the carousel of time, things coming around and around again? Was that part of the decision? Well, part of that song says you can't return, you can only look behind to where you've been um, and go round and round in the circle game if you don't know Joni Mitchell. But uh, I, I, and I um, definitely after 20 years, I had seen the legislative circle and the structure of it to the point where it was becoming a lot easier for me to predict how things were going to turn out in the end. And um, I, I want to say that I really have a stronger belief in the process than when I entered. I, I entered the legislature from the activist side of politics. I entered fairly cynical about, frankly, Democrats and Republicans. And my thoughts were they don't always seem that different from each other. And I don't really get this process, which has a lot of conflict tied to it. And what I learned is that we really divide the power up in um, our political process. And in Washington state, we really divide the power up because we not only have the traditional three branches of government, government but we have the initiative process as well. And so there are all sorts of checks and balances, um, Democrats, Republicans, House, Senate, Governor, Judicial, executive, so many checks and balances to actually moving social policy forward. And so my conclusion about that after these years is my blog that is titled, It's Not Enough to Be Right. And what that means is, of course, it's, it's good to be right in the sense of having the facts on your side or, or having the values on your side, but that won't get your policy enacted. You've got to work the process and the public process and bring together the votes and the public momentum to sustain your policy or it will get reversed at the ballot box or thwarted somehow in the process. We in, in the media and a lot of the coverage focuses on the difference and the battles over this, that and the other thing. I was kind of surprised to hear um, Lisa Brown in this interview with Austin Jenkins say that basically in this $30 billion plus budget there's a lot of agreement by both political parties that doesn't get mentioned quite enough, that actually there's kind of a consensus. In fact, you went so far as to say that changing the parties wouldn't change large portions of the budget 
And I wondered if you shared that view, Joe Zarelli. Is it, are there that many differences between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to this huge chunk of money in the budget? No, I, I think that there, there's an arc uh, to changing structurally what you do in the budget. And in the interim, there's not a lot of change in how you budget, if that makes sense. And really what I'm saying is it's kind of what I've tried to focus on, and that's changing how government does things, realizing that along the way, you're not going to really save money initially, but you're going to change ultimately long term, hopefully, how you spend the money. And, and from that, hopefully get to a more prioritized picture of how we're spending uh, money that we collect. And that's kind of been the goal. And I, I think that you come around differences about um, how you get to an end. Um, I think that, believe it or not, Republicans and Democrats don't share a lot of difference around um, a lot of public policy. We want to do uh, uh, and serve the same types of areas, uh, but we have different ideas about how to solve that problem, and that becomes kind of what we get stuck in the mud on. Uh, and so, you know, education at all levels. Both sides want to fund that. But, you know, on the Republican side, for us, it's not just about money. We want to see that we're getting something for that money, and I think parents want to, and we owe it to the kids. So we want to make sure that we're getting the necessary uh, places that we're investing that money. It's not just about pay and benefits for the people who teach kids. It's about what kids are leaving school with. And um, so we've focused more on changing the paradigm around uh, the policy that we're spending money on. Uh, so it really doesn't change ultimately how much money gets spent. You're probably going to spend more. We will spend more. Um, but sh it should change structurally how the money's spent to get us to a better outcome from our perspective. So I think that's where a lot of the nuanced differences are. And I, I know we probably share a lot of those things too. We just have different approaches because there are still some big elephants in Olympia that control the destiny of too many things. Oh, and, like what? Huh? What? <laughs> Point out <laughs> and, one of those it elephants. It shouldn't be that us. way. What, like what? What elephants? Um, well, in the education arena, I mean, really the dictator is still the WEA. It's not, it's the members, it's the leadership of the Washington Education Association that dictates policy investment uh, by the legislature, and that's not the way it should be. We should recognize, support, appreciate, and pay well uh, those who educate at all levels of uh, the process, but our focus as um, keepers for the taxpayer is to make sure that we're getting value for the money we're spending, i.e. kids. Uh, are coming out the other end of the process with skill sets that meet the expectation of the community. Well, I'm sure there's some things the Washington Education Association stands for that you agree with. Could you be like a little bit more specific on why you see them as an elephant and in some ways is it should not be paid as much attention to? Because politically too many people won't do what they believe they should do simply because they don't want it. Who and, and what things? You know, I'll, I'll tell you a little story going back years. I'm sure Senator Bauer wouldn't mind. I remember my first couple of years in the Senate. I was in the back. Al was in the front. And Senator Al Bauer was a Democrat, teacher, uh, farmer, uh, came from the 49th District, a very Democrat district in southwest Washington, Clark County. And I remember at that young time in my career, I was trying to bring some of these changes forward in education via amendments on the floor. And I remember Al would call me on the floor, because we all have phones, you see. Zarelli, I agree with you on that, but dang it, I'll get in trouble if I vote for that. I mean, that's the kind of politics that happens because there's the politics of trying to get things done, but there's also the influence outside that moves the process along. Lisa Brown, can you tell me that never happens? No, I wouldn't tell you that never happens, but I guess I would say that I think we have a much more fundamental issue that we're facing in Washington State than public employee unions or, or teachers unions, which uh, are there to serve their members. Um, I think they enter the profession because they care about kids and kids' outcomes, but I also think that um, professional associations, whether it's the medical association or the nurses or the Association of Washington Business, are out there representing the narrow interests of their members, which is not always the common interest that legislators have to balance when we're putting a budget together. 
But I believe that there's been too much scapegoating of public employee unions and teachers unions as if they were responsible for our budget crisis, and I don't think they are. I think we have a structural problem that's much bigger. We've gone without pay raises and actual pay decreases, increased class sizes. A lot of things have happened as a result of the budget and, and recessionary dilemma that we were in that I don't think legislators on either side of the aisle uh, really agreed with, but we have a structural problem we're not facing, and I believe we have a structural imbalance in the tools we have to face it. And you both talk about structural problems, but I think in, in different ways. Lisa Brown, you've talked about our broken revenue system in the state. What do you mean by that? It, it is. When I came in in the 1990s, uh, you agree or disagree, our um, general fund budget and government spending uh, which essentially goes to educate, medicate, and incarcerate, uh, in relationship to our private economy, put us in about the top third uh, uh, in comparison with other states. We're now in the bottom third. And I think of Washington State as a state that wants to be above average. I've, you've, many of you have heard me say this before. We're like the mythical uh, place that Garrison Keillor talks about, Lake Wobegon. Women are strong, the men are good looking, the children are all above average. And you know what, if that's not true, we want it to be true. We want our parks and our schools and even our coffee to be above average. And I don't think you can do that with a tax structure that's the most unequal in the country and clearly below average. So I'm, I'm confident in saying that and said it even when I probably shouldn't as as the leader of the Senate Democrats, but I think our revenue structure is part of the structural problem we're facing, and that the, the ta and that the initiatives that say you can pass a tax break with 50 percent, but you need two thirds to reverse that tax break, tie one of our hands behind the back. Ah, when, we're on the we, super majority. We'll definitely get back to when that. When we are <laughs> solving the budget problem. Um, so th there's the way that taxes get passed, and the way that tax um, breaks get revoked, which I definitely want to get to, that's also going to be on the ballot this year. 